Hello, my name is Amelia, and I have absolutely no sense of direction. It's true. I think I was born without one. Without fail, without some kind of GPS or map, I will always go the opposite way from where I need to go. Only two directions to leave my hotel room? No prob! I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> oh, more rooms. Ah, not the elevator like I was looking for. <laughs> the same is true when I'm on the street or in a parking lot. The car is parked on one side of the building. I will always go the opposite way. Fortunately, my lack of direction does not translate to my IoT designs, which may actually need to know where they are and where they're going from time to time. Phew, sure glad that stuff doesn't rub off. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Maybe you don't want your next IoT design to not get lost, to be able to work with a bunch of different satellite constellations, not blow your power budget, and not take a super long time doing it. Well, you're in luck. Today, my guest is Mike Slade from ST Microelectronics, and he is here with the goods on the Tessio Live 3F module, which will make tracking and your outdoor positioning and your next IoT design a whole lot easier. Let's get started. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about the Tessio Live 3 f module from ST Microelectronics. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks. It's great to be here. So, Mike, my IoT design is totally lost, and I'm thinking it could use some location information. I bet you can help me out with that? I certainly can. Actually, the Tessio Live 3 f GNSS module is what you need. It is the first member of our Tessio module family, and it is designed to allow you to get to market faster because it's a lot simpler than using our chipset. And it's perfect for IoT product designs because it's very conscious of power, size, and cost. So it is designed with multi-constellation support, so it allows it to be best in class precision-wise in the world. The assisted GNSS feature helps it reduce the time it takes to get that first position fix. It supports various low power modes, which are very important for IoT applications. Absolutely. And on the upper right, the geofencing, odometer, and data logging applications that are there are perfect for child tracking, pet tracking, insurance tracking, and fleet trackers of all kinds. And lastly, I'd say the biggest asset is that it's a flash-based module that allows you to upgrade the firmware over the life of the product. So it actually gets better as it's in the field over the years because it takes into account the improvements that we make on a regular basis to our firmware. And it allows you to also configure that feature set specifically for your application and even tailor it on the fly for applications that move around the world. I love when my designs get better after I've shipped them to customers. <laughs> <laughs> now, can we peek under the hood and see what's in this module? This location stuff has always been a bit of a mystery to me. Sure, sure. So starting in the upper left-hand corner, this is the footprint of the Live3F module, and it shows a TCXO, which helps you get that fast time to first fix, which is very important. An RTC, which helps you keep accurate time when you're in low power standby mode for those IoT applications that only want to do periodic fixes and very quick periodic fixes so that they're up for a second or two and then back asleep and consuming as little power as possible. Then in the upper right, you can see there's 16 megabits of flash. That's where we actually execute the code and store data for certain applications. In the center, you can see is the Tessio 3 chipset, and I'll go into that, but that's the heart of the module itself. And then on the lower right, you can see power management supports a wide range of voltages from 2.1 to 4.3 volts. And in the lower left is the connectivity interfaces that allow you to communicate to and from the host via either UART or I squared C. And it's all in this tiny package, which is 9.7 by 10.1 millimeters. And it's actually a standard LCC 18 pin package that's capable of working up to 85 degrees C. Okay, cool. And for the nerdy people in our audience like me, which I'm guessing is most of us actually, can we dive a little deeper into that chipset? 
Gladly. So I'm an engineer by trade, so I love to go as deep as people are interested in going. So this upper right is the green box that shows the RF front end interface, which actually does the job of down converting those very weak GPS satellite signals coming from the satellites that are 20,000 miles away and down converting them and digitizing them and passing them to that box on the upper left, which is a DSP. So that DSP actually samples and tries to acquire and track all the different signals and hands those bits of tracking information and decoded data to the ARM core, which does all the baseband processing and computes the position, the velocity, and very accurate time for use in all these applications we talked about. And in the right side larger red box are all the various peripherals that the Tessio 3 chip also supports. So it's an SOC with a lot of functionality that supports the full gamut of what an IoT application really needs. And then the lower right is a power management unit. And lastly, in the blue box is the backup domain so that we're able to run an RTC when it's in low power standby mode and store information and allow it to come back out of standby mode and very quickly perform all the activities it needs to do in seconds and then go back to sleep. Wow, that's a lot packed into a small chipset. Now, Mike, can you give me a rundown on what kinds of applications this would work for? Sure. So like I mentioned, IoT is its main focus and certainly in that are asset trackers of all types. So people and pets and packages and even trucks for transportation companies and insurance trackers that, for example, plugged into a car and monitor a driver's habits, for example. And that's a very big application these days, but others like anti-theft and telematics applications of all kinds make it kind of an ideal fit for all those because of the preloaded applications I mentioned are already on there. Now, I know most of us have heard of GPS, but I keep hearing about more satellite constellations getting added. So can you clarify what exactly is GNSS? Sure. So GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite Systems, and GPS is just one of those constellations or systems which is owned by the U.S. The GLONASS constellation by Russia, the Galileo constellation by the EU, and the Baidu constellation by China round out the four GNSS constellations. And these circled in red are the actual specific signals for each of those constellations that the TESIO supports. And in fact, you can see to the left of those, there are many other frequencies and signals that are supported by those constellations, but they are used for other applications. And actually the benefits of having these four available is more than sufficient for the IoT products that you'll design for. So that inoculates me in case some country decides to turn off their satellites at some point. I've still got something going on. Absolutely. In fact, we've had customers who've had to do as much. Yep. Okay, so along those lines, Mike, what are the benefits of tracking more constellations than just GPS, for example? Sure. So the Tessio 2, which is the predecessor to Tessio 3 that's in the Live3F, was the first to do simultaneous multi-constellation. So the benefit is more satellites available to you at any given time in any given place and inherently better accuracy. So this chart just depicts a person standing in a narrow street in Milan and those streets often have very little visibility to the sky and in this case this test we ran for 24 hours and if you see the second row in red the percentage of time that there was no fix when you were running GPS only was 25 percent of the time but as soon as you add GLONASS to the mix there was never a time when there was no fix in that specific location so it's really proof that if you're living in an urban area and you're definitely going to be in an obstructed environment, the benefit to having a second and now a third and fourth constellation is immense. It's a differentiator for your products. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's jump back to the module itself. What will I need to know to integrate this into my design? Sure. It's actually very simple, as you can see from this block diagram. On the upper left, you're connecting a power supply 
as I mentioned, which can range from 2.1 to 4.3 volts. And on the right side, you see there's, again, very few connections. The main design criteria, which actually we spell out on our hardware users manuals available online, is a saw filter needed to filter out extraneous signals. If you're co-locating this chip with another communications IC, like a Bluetooth IC, and an LNA, possibly depending on the antenna you choose, whether it's a passive or an active. And again, we have a lot of information online that helps direct you in that design for your specific choice of antenna. And then lastly, on the lower right, you can see that there's a RS-232 interface that allows communication to your host and is the main way for your host to query the module and for you to pass information to it. That looks pretty straightforward. I can see handling this pretty well with my design. Now, you touched on this a little earlier, but once I've got the hardware designed in, what kind of capabilities will this bring into my IoT product? Uh, sure. So we chose to implement certain applications we know are useful and used today, and data logging being one of them, where we allow logging positions over a period of time and storing them in that flash memory. And for applications like insurance tracking, they may want to minimize the amount of bandwidth they use to transmit their data up to a server. And so they really only want to store it locally, but access subsets of that data from time to time and pass it up so that they're not spending so much on their data transfers and really refining their product's ability to use only the information that they know is of value. Then geofencing also is perfect for those trackers. Like I mentioned, a child tracker who is worn around a school or home, you can set geofences areas around those places and then an alarm or a different communication mode is triggered when they've gone outside that fence. So perhaps if they left that area, they could switch to a cellular modem that would communicate to any application where the child or asset is and that it's left the home area. And then lastly, the odometer is a nice function for someone like a fleet tracker. As fleet trackers become pretty ubiquitous in trucks and even cars like taxis around the world, it's really good for them to be able to track their distance easily. Absolutely. Now, sometimes I know my design won't have ideal reception, as you were mentioning, but you were talking about that there are some assistance capabilities built into this. Tell me more about this. So assistance methods vary by the presence of a modem connection to get access from a server. And the self-trained method on the left is the method that doesn't need internet access. In fact, it takes and decodes the signals from the satellite when you first acquire them. And then it actually has an algorithm on chip that just runs in the background to propagate the satellite trajectories over what it says is a six day period without again needing any server access and allows you to get what we call hot start fixes with times to first fix of one to four seconds, depending on your signal level. So it's a really great way of achieving those fast fixes without having to spend all that power and time getting data from a server. But if you do have a design that has connectivity, then the predicted or real-time methods are great for passing the data down and essentially alleviating the need to do all that data decode, which is time-consuming but is necessary if you don't have the connection. And it allows a longer period, as it says, 14-day prediction of the satellite trajectories and the same TTFF of one to four seconds. I remember some of my early GPS devices could take several minutes to get a fix. Yeah. Okay, so since I am doing an IoT design, and I think a lot of people share this same concern, I'm really very tight on power budget. So will this device consume a lot of my power budget, or what have we got to manage or mitigate power consumption? That's a great question because the Live 3F and the Tessio 3 itself were designed to minimize power and the standby current, which is what most IoT designs spend their time in, is the lowest of any in the industry. It's seven microamps for the chip alone. For the Live 3F, it's a little more than that because of other components, but essentially the modes we've put in place are what we enable those applications to do to use it in just the way it needs to be used and no more. So for example, on the far right, the periodic mode is probably the most interesting to the IoT community because it allows them to program or trigger a fix upon a certain time frame or 
an event such as an accelerometer input and then simply get that fix based upon all the information I mentioned it may have already gotten in the assisted GNSS modes and then provide that position and then go back to sleep. On the left, the adaptive and the duty cycle are other specific modes for certain very specific IoT applications, but are also useful to reduce power if you're going to be in more of a continuous mode of GPS tracking and not periodic. Got it. Okay. When I want to get started designing, I'm going to need a development kit or a board. What have you got for me here? So ST developed two boards. The one on the top is the X Nucleo GNSS 1A1 which is actually tailored for any development that is STM32 centric. And it's an X nucleo board that plugs onto the STM32 nucleo board and there's an X-Cube software package that allows you to configure it as you wish so that you can get the NEMA data out to your STM32 host and through the UART or I2C connection. And it's available today at Mauser's website. And the other device, the EVB Live3F, is more for an evaluation and, like I said, a non-STM32 specific design. And is a little more robust, as you can see in that aluminum package, for even doing some field trials and evaluation. Got it. Okay. So when we're done here, I will click that link and go to the Mauser site and be ordering one of those. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the software tool side of things. It seems like there would be a little complexity in the software to back this up. You're right. The Tessio Suite tool kind of aggregates all the tools that we use to flash and test and configure the Tessio Live3F module. So it is a complete solution for anybody who wants to completely understand how well this module works and even configure it in very specific modes, like I said, since it's highly configurable. And even write test scripts to do testing if they have certain areas that they know they have to verify for their product. This can be set up as a test tool for production test, in fact. Awesome. Well, I think I will be clicking that link and going to the Mauser site and getting more information about this. It was a pleasure speaking with you today, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Amelia. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can head on over to a Mauser.com page that will tell you all sorts of information about the Tessio Live3F module from ST Microelectronics. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. Can't miss it, right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.